so I'll see if this works out well and maybe I can upload it to the internet somewhere. Um, okay, so what I'm going to be talking about today with my silly slide advancer thing here um, is a research project that I did for ISIC Partners. Is this going to go? Do you want me to twist this because you're getting cut off? Uh, sure, thanks. Um, all right, so a little background about me. Uh, I work for ISIC Partners. We're an application security consultancy with offices in San Francisco, Seattle, and, and uh, New York. Uh, the most important thing you need to know about my company is that I don't have a product to sell you. Instead, what I'm going to be talking about today are analysis techniques and data that I've collected and how you can use that data to make a more informed, a less costly, a more effective defense, uh, IT network defense, um, than if you did not have this data or know these analysis techniques or uh, have sat in this presentation. Um, there's no sort of magic box that I can give you that will prevent or detect everything that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, so basically the gist of this presentation is that I'm, I'm trying to prove that an intelligence-driven threat-focused security uh, approach to security um, is practical and effective. It's typically dismissed very quickly by people in the uh, network defense community, by people in IT, uh, and more defenses are shifting towards things like compliance. But uh, as we know from a lot of the larger attacks that have been going on in the last, or that have been made public in the last few months, uh, compliance doesn't mean that you're secure. Uh, compliance just means that you've, you've got good personal hygiene, you've washed your hands, right? But washing your hands isn't going to prevent you from getting something like malaria or a more specific threat that is targeting your organization. So what I'm showing you are um, that there's another way to go about this and that it can be more effective against specific threats than simply compliance. Okay, uh, this next slide is for people that download the slides. So let's start off with something that I think everybody in here is familiar with. This is a dog photographer. I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, this is a graph of vulnerability disclosures over time. And I'm sure that everybody has seen these and I'm sure that everybody knows that they're useless. Uh, the reasons why they're useless are because, like, look over here on the right, we have percent of remotely exploitable vulnerabilities over time. It's hovering near 90%. We've got number of vulnerabilities that are being disclosed every year going up to about 8,000 per year, right? How do I tell which one of those are the most important to me? Uh, how do I tell? Um, how do I tell if these are just XSSs that have been found in like various PHP scripts that are downloaded from FreshMeet, or how do I tell that uh, one of these vulnerabilities is um, inside of my organization and can be exploited in a very easy manner to make me lose money? Uh, you know, which, which ones are important, uh, how quickly do they become important, if I patched one of them, did I effectively patch it, or is there a, a workaround that an attacker can perform to still exploit that vulnerability, um, was there an exploit available before the patch was available, uh, is there a business case that delays a patch, like, uh, like Java, people tend to not upgrade Java because there are so many different factors involved in upgrading it that people accept the risk of vulnerabilities in Java. So this kind of analysis leaves a lot to be desired. Uh, so now let me ask you guys, how many vulnerabilities of those 8,000 did you think you had to pay attention to in 2009 and 2010 to be safe 95% of the time? Anyone want to take a guess out of 8,000? 10 or 20. 10. In 2010, there were 13 vulnerabilities that were massively exploited. And, and by this, I mean greater than the upper 80% of, of uh, compromises on the internet. Uh, in 2009, the number was about the same, about 14. And I can take this data, I can go all the way back to 2006, and the number just about holds. It's about 15 per year that are actually critically important to everybody, to everybody that's a non-tech organization, to everybody that runs an internal network, to everybody that runs computer software, uh, to your mom, to your company, uh, to everybody. So. The question is, now at this point, knowing this data, is there something we might be doing wrong? Are we going about network security? Are we going about information security wrong? Uh, so keep that in mind as we go on. So throwing away the really basic analysis of there's lots of vulnerabilities out there, this is how uh, one company that specializes in, uh, in vulnerabilities has analyzed this data. This is from Secunia. Uh, they're a vulnerability database. And what they do is they collect and aggregate information about vulnerabilities and then sell it to large uh, corporate customers as intelligence. Uh, they also have a product around this 
called Sakunia Sai, which is a, a desktop application that collects information about vulnerable software that's installed on those computers for that agent. So using that data, they were able to show that in 2010, two-thirds of the vulnerabilities on any given computer were the result of third-party software, and about one-third were the result of first-party software, so operating system software and Microsoft software. So the obvious implication here is that you have to pay attention to third-party software because it has the, the largest magnitude of vulnerabilities. But you know what? I don't care about vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities only matter to me when they're actually exploited, right? So in this case, are attackers going after the larger two-thirds or are they going after the baseline that's available on all of the computers they're going to attack? Do they attack the Microsoft software they know exists on all the computers, or that might be hardened more than the third-party software? So, like, th this graph, even though it has a more advanced analysis of all those 8,000 that happen per year, uh, it still doesn't tell me what I want to know. So if I actually look at the data, I can show you that in 2010, there were only four or five unique targets that were exploited out of all those that were in the last graph. Uh, this starts to become more actionable. And if we look at the actual targets, we see that it's focused on the dominant platforms that are installed on your computer. So yes, it might be third-party software like Flash, Reader, Java, QuickTime, but I don't know if I actually consider that stuff third-party. Right? It's installed basically everywhere. Flash and Reader have a 95% market penetration rate. Java has about 75%. Internet Explorer is on every Windows computer, and it's the default browser for most corporations. And QuickTime hovers somewhere between 50 and 65%. Uh, so despite all these vulnerabilities in third-party applications, a very small number of them are being targeted. And really, when you look at this, don't you think that like two-thirds of the software on any person's given computer is going to be third-party anyway? Like, Don't you just randomly install software right after you get, get the computer? So this, it, it, it's really telling me something that I should already know, that I have two-thirds more third-party software on my computer than I did um, have coming from the vendor. So here's another way that Sakunia looks at it. They released this report at RSA. I call this one Wheel of Vulnerability Fortune. Uh, this very complicated graph um, basically says that on any given computer that Sakunia Sai, that Sakunia's customers analyze, there are 75 known public vulnerabilities latent on that computer that have not yet been patched. Uh, that's across their entire customer base. Now, again, do I care? Which, like, if that were true across the entire internet, don't you think that botnets would even would be even larger? Uh, what what the reality is is that there's one vulnerability out of those 75 that's going to do you in, right? And those other 74 don't don't really matter that much. The attack vector to get to them might not be important. They might not be in a target that gets attacked. Uh, so again. If we look at the data, I can actually give you a very good indication that one of those targets is going to be first, that one of them is going to be exploited more uh, or, or quickly um, sooner than all the others. And the way that I can tell that is based on where the vulnerability was first disclosed. If it was first disclosed as part of a targeted attack, you, you better guess that uh, that's going to be massively abused in the days uh, afterward. Again, if it were released as a zero-day disclosure, if it were released by a, uh, by a white hat security researcher to a public forum with exploit code and they didn't notify the vendor, these are jumped on quickly by people that massively abuse vulnerabilities. And uh, another thing that you see when you look at the data are that these massively abused vulnerabilities, uh, the people that, people that do these kinds of things, they're not finding their own. They're taking them from public sources after they've been uh, described in public forums. Uh, so finally, hopefully you're, you're understanding what I'm getting at here. Uh, this is a report from Bit9 where they identify the top vulnerable apps of 2010. What they did is they have another agent that sits on people's boxes and it can collect information about what software is vulnerable and what software is not. So among all their customers, uh, they tallied up you know, all the most popular software and all the different vulnerabilities that are included in those pieces of software. And they found that Google Chrome had the largest number of vulnerabilities disclosed in 2010. It's the most insecure piece of software on your entire operating system. And they compared that to other applications like Apple WebKit, which had less, but still made their top 10 dirty, or top 12 dirty dozen list. Um, so if you've been following along, then you could probably guess how many vulnerabilities were massively exploited in Google Chrome in 2010. What do you want to take a guess? Zero to one. Zero. 
Uh, so really, is Google Chrome the most insecure application on your computer? And I'll go through other reasons why it's not, but just by this fact alone, uh, there's a clear difference between Google Chrome and other things that are installed on your computer. So are we doing something wrong? Yes, we are doing something wrong. We're looking at the wrong target to analyze. We're looking at vulnerabilities. We're looking at malicious software uh, like you know malware and bots and things, but we're not actually looking at attacks holistically. We're not looking at uh, the capabilities that people have to exploit software. We're not looking at the motives behind um, like how they're doing that. Uh, there's a lot of different things that if we did know, we might be able to answer that would be valuable to us. Things like where do bad guys get their information from? Because if we know, if we knew, then we could watch those locations too, right? And we try, lots of different companies try to, to look at locations where bad guys would get their data from. They look at, uh, they read mailing lists like Full Disclosure, or read websites like ExploitDB or the old Millworm. Um, but is that really what attackers pay attention to? Um, some people look at Metasploit. Metasploit is very popular among people that are doing basic network defense in, in a corporate uh, environment, but is that a good indicator for whether something's going to actually get abused? Uh, how do bad guys evaluate the new vulnerabilities that come out? Because the CVSS score, the, the industry standard rating system that we use to analyze vulnerabilities, may indicate a higher level of importance than uh, the, the, the rating scale that's up in an attacker's head. And if we collect information about how these guys operate, then we can evaluate vulnerabilities the same way they do, which is way more important than a silly CVSS score. Uh, and then finally, we can compare our defenses specifically against certain attack groups. We can say that uh, w we can properly evaluate the uh, effectiveness of our attacks, because I'm sure everybody that's been compromised by APT has gotten out in the press and said, you know, oh, we had all the latest defenses, we had this checkbox and this checkbox and this checkbox, but they did nothing. So hopefully what I uh, will get across is a, is a method to evaluate whether the security processes, the security products, um, the, whatever the heck you guys have to defend yourself, whether it's effective against a particular attacker, because that's what's important. Uh, right, all right, so. How many people in the room actually have to work at a company that defends against APT on a regular basis? Raise your hand. Okay, like three, okay. How many people have to work at a company that defends against mass malware on a regular basis? Like Zeus, Gozi, Clampy, whatever? Okay, same three people. <laughs> Usually, pretty much everybody raises their hand because if you own a computer, you have to defend against mass malware. Your parents have to defend against mass malware. You're, you're, uh, uh, sons and daughters at college have to defend against mass malware. It affects everybody. And part of the problem right now is that APT is in vogue and people try to target it to, to prevent against it. But um, how do you expect to defend against an advanced persistent threat when you can't stop yourself from getting hacked by accident? So what we're going to do is we're going to go after some of the long-standing problems in information security today and I'm going to show you how to use an intelligence-based approach to wipe out the capability of mass malware to operate inside of your network. Okay, so mass malware. First, we have to define what we're actually talking about. Uh, and in order to do that, I'm going to use an analysis tool called the kill chain. Uh, this might be familiar to some of you if you've been working in the intelligence community. Basically, it's a systematic model for evaluating intrusions. It's a step-by-step -step process that all intrusions must follow in order for an attacker to, to gain something of value. Um, it's really good because it objectively evaluates attacker capabilities. When you see like a blog post on an antivirus industry blog, they usually glitz up and make uh, like attacker capabilities look like a big sales sheet to scare you, to have FUD. Um, what the kill chain does is it removes all that. It shows you objectively what they performed at every step of their intrusion so that we can match up our defenses against each step. And that's what helps us objectively evaluate our defenses in turn. Uh, this is typically used as a model to defend against APT. It's a very heavy stick. Um, the reason why it's effective is because it, it evolves response beyond the point of compromise. Most people working in incident response, working in IT security, tend to think that uh, the whole process starts once somebody's got code running on their computer, once they've been infected, once they have malware. Uh, what this does is it broadens our, our view of things and forces us to consider the things that happened before that malware got there. So we're going to use this as a crutch to make sure we understand the full scope of the problem. And then finally, it assumes unfixable vulnerabilities. The problem with incident response, the problem with security today, is that everybody thinks that 
an intrusion is the result of a fixable vulnerability. And that's simply not true. So we use the kill chain to, uh, as a crutch uh, to make sure that we know that there are unfixable vulnerabilities here. There are things that we can't do to stop people from getting inside of our network. So uh, we need to gather more data. We need to look at it in a, in a broader way. And then I have to give credit where credit is due. The first person who applied this technique, uh, this kill chain model to um, IT security was uh, a guy named Mike Clopper who writes on the Sans Forensics blog and works for Lockheed Martin. Uh, very smart guy. So let's just start off. I'm not even going to define what the kill chain is. It'll become obvious as I go on here. Mass malware performs reconnaissance. Uh, they perform reconnaissance in a way that's different than most of us think about reconnaissance. They ask themselves, where do rich Americans browse the web? And they predominantly browse the web on a couple different sites. They browse them on sites that have advertisements, uh, they use search engines, they go on social networks, and then there's a long tail of other, other websites that we go to on a daily basis. And the way that mass malware performs reconnaissance is they expose themselves to us on all these different forums in a couple different ways. These are the top four. They put malicious advertisements, they do search engine optimization to get themselves up in search results, they compromise friends and send messages to people in order to uh, get them to click on links, and they perform SQL injection on massive numbers of sites at the same time. Uh, about maybe a month ago, there were the Liza Moon attacks, which was a SQL injection worm that infected about 1.5 million different websites at once uh, and injected malicious code into those websites. Uh, iTunes was, iTunes.com, Apple.com was among those affected. Uh, so it's kind of impossible to, to not be exposed to mass malware. If you browse the web, you will be exposed to it at some point in time. The next thing they do, is they have to purchase weapons. They go out and they purchase something called a web exploit kit or a crimeware pack. Uh, these are packages of somewhere between five and 20 exploits and they sell for between 200 to $2,000. Uh, these include things like obfuscation techniques to get by IDS and uh, we're gonna talk about that more later. Uh, then they take these two components and stitch them together into a complex delivery network. Most of you are familiar or may have heard the words fast flux network or a double flux network. This is an example of looks like a single flux network, um, that can encompass uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of different IP addresses. So good luck, uh, good luck finding a blacklist that identifies all of those uh, quicker than they can exploit you. After they've exposed themselves to you and delivered an exploit from one of those crimeware packs over their complicated fast flux network, they're going to exploit an application on your computer, typically a client-side application like Firefox, Internet Explorer, Adobe Reader, QuickTime, or Java. Um, this is the first point at which they're executing code on your system, that they've stepped foot into your environment. After this, they install malware. Uh, the big one right now is SpyEye. They typically encode it in a certain way. Uh, this is encoded in a way to uh, avoid antivirus detection. Uh, this virus trap service is like VirusTotal in reverse. Uh, it's a service where you can take a, a binary, upload it, and then it pops out something that can't get detected by antivirus at the current time. Uh, this malware calls back out over a complicated delivery network, uh, the same one that was used to send it down. So again, good luck trying to pick out these IP addresses from the needle in the haystack of your network traffic. And then finally, uh, what mass malware guys do is they, they have to perform actions on objectives. They have to make this somehow valuable to them. So they, uh, they collect credentials, put them into these websites, and these guys uh, launder and cash out all the, all the different credentials and money that they've accumulated. And all of this, all these seven steps come together, turn into a giant cyber Pompeii that we can't seem to solve as an industry. So let's take a look at the whole thing from top to bottom again. This is the kill chain on the left. Seven really basic steps. They perform reconnaissance by infecting millions of sites with different uh, pieces of malicious code that get exposed to us. They weaponize from among thousands of vulnerabilities that I've already discussed are very difficult to try and figure out. Uh, you know, which ones are important and to patch them effectively and to work around business cases to not patch them or to even figure out if your users installed some software that's not supported and uh, now have vulnerabilities that you're not patching. Like if your organization allows Firefox and doesn't, doesn't patch it, that's a really common thing. Uh, they deliver all this over a complicated delivery network, thousands of IP addresses. They use tens of different exploits across those client-side applications in order to gain code execution on your machine. Uh, they create millions of malware samples, mostly unique per install, in order to evade things like antivirus, and then they call back out over those complicated networks, over those fast flux networks, uh, with thousands and thousands of IP addresses. So 
What do we see here? All of our defenses are aligned along the most robust nodes in the kill chain. But the one thing that people tend to forget about is that there's a very weak node here, uh, which is the exploitation step. Just looking at the, uh, at the magnitude that I've described here, the tens at exploits, that seems like a manageable number. Uh, but everything else that we've got, blacklists, IDS, IDS would target thousands of vulnerabilities. Blacklists would target the reconnaissance phase and the, the installation phase. Um, we're all targeting the most robust nodes of the kill chain. So what I'm going to try and do is target the weakest one. And we're going to see if we can break the whole chain from start to finish so that they're unable to complete it. Uh, I also find this step pretty interesting to analyze because, um, as I mentioned here, it's the last point that you have control of your data. Uh, everything before this occurs outside your network. You can't do anything about it. Um, everything after this is stuff that goes on inside of your network. It's on your computer, it's on your network, it's captured in your logs, so on and so forth. So this tends to be a pretty interesting point to analyze. It's your last line of defense. So let's see what we can do. So how do we perform collection against the exploitation step of the kill chain? This is my super cool Ferrari tank. <laughs> First, we need to know what we're dealing with. Uh, in order to, to figure out exactly what we're dealing with, I told you we use these crimeware packs in order to, uh, to gain access to the different exploits that are going to be used by mass malware. Uh, crimeware packs, like I said, contain somewhere between 5 and 20 exploits, and they're sold for between 2000 or 200 and 2000 dollars. So what I did is I approached a good friend of mine who works over at ThreatGrid, which is a uh, little stealth mode startup based here in New York, and they collect data about volume of exploitation of uh, this huge mass malware problem. And he was able to give me a list of malicious URLs from quarter one of 2011 and the exploit kits that were associated with those malicious URLs. So I can tally up all that data and I can get a rough approximation of the popularity of different exploit kits that are in use. And what I found was there's actually a relatively small number. There's like mm, 20, 25, 30 on this list, but 99% of them are all on the top 10 and 85% of them are all on the top four. So we can actually perform analysis on a small number of these exploit packs and actually gain coverage of a very wide segment of this problem. So you might be asking yourself, well, you know, I don't know anybody at ThreatGrid. How would I be able to get ac gain access to this data to figure out what's going on? Uh, there's many other different areas on the internet where you can gain access to uh, uh, different intelligence-related information about these exploit kits. Uh, ABG Threat Labs is the screenshot over here. Uh, they use different um, browser plugins and desktop software in order to match up this data. For their customers, the Black Hall Exploit Kit was the number one uh, web threat that was affecting them uh, around, this was like mid-April. Uh, this is the same thing that Dean was seeing. I just got data before the Black Hall Exploit Kit became very popular. Uh, Malware Domain List, Krebs and Security, all these guys track um, the proliferation of these different crimeware packs. So what I did is I went and collected not only the top 10, so the top 10 represented 99% of the volume, I collected the top 15. So I have pretty good coverage of what's going on here in the underground. I even got uh, multiple versions of certain exploit kits so I could track their development over time. The next thing I had to do was I had to take a look at these exploit kits in a way that allowed me to analyze them. Most of them were encoded in some way to prevent analysis. So I used two different services to decode them. Uh, JS Unpack decodes JavaScript uh, from a variety of different sources, so inside of an HTML file, inside of a PDF file, uh, inside of a bunch of other different document formats. And then I also used Decode by Us, which is a web service to deobfuscate PHP code, which is what most of these crimeware packs were written in. At this point, now I have unencrypted or un unobfuscated uh, PHP and JavaScript, which is what these attacks are written in. Uh, I can write signatures for them using a lightweight signature engine like Yara um, in order to detect exploits. So I'm writing signatures to detect exploits, not malware. Very, very uh, important difference here. Uh, from that, I'm able to get the exact vulnerabilities that are being exploited, the CVE identifier for that vulnerability. And I can plug that into something called Shodan, which has a, uh, a very simple to use Python API in front of many different vulnerability databases, things like uh, ExploitDB, the Metasploit framework, the actual CVE database or OSVDB. And then um, from that information, I can take it and analyze it in some way uh, in order to identify trends or look at other interesting data. 
Uh, the last thing I could do is, because I have ac access to the kits, is I could perform live testing on the exploits. I can actually try them inside of a virtualized environment to see what they do and how they were written. Um, I didn't even need to go this far. Uh, the, the first three steps were, were uh, comprehensive enough that I was able to get the data I wanted without performing that last step. So a little bit about Yara. Uh, this is what one of the signatures I look like, uh, one of the signatures I wrote looked like. Uh, this is a signature for CVE 2009-3672, which is the IE style vulnerability. It's a basic string matching uh, application where I have these three strings, and if those three strings are located in the same file, then this is an exploit for that particular vulnerability. And uh, you can see it has to match all of them. And if the, if the file matches those three, uh, three strings, then uh, the word CVE 2009-3672 will be printed out. So this is what JS Unpack looks like, or Yara looks like, when I run it with my rule set against one of the exploit kits. In this, I ran, uh, I ran it against the Eleanor kit, uh, version 1.4.1, um, and you can see with my rule set, it automatically pops out all the different exploits that are being used. Now from those, I take the CVE and I pump it into a Python script that I wrote using the Shodan API, and it gives me all this additional metadata about the vulnerability. This is an example of what it looks like to run it with CV 2010-18-18. It tells me that the first public exploit was available on August 30th, 2010, that it was written by a guy named Ruben Santamarta, and he called the Apple QuickTime Marshall Punk backdoor. Uh, it was, and it's tracked in exploit DB uh, number 14843. It can also tell me that it was later improved upon by a guy named JDuck from the Metasploit project, renamed to the QuickTime 767 Marshall Punk code execution vulnerability, I get a textual description of it, I get a, an identifier that points to it in the Metasploit kit, and I also get a ranking. So Metasploit exploits are professionally developed. Rapid7 sponsors the development of these exploits for their kit. Uh, it's very important because penetration testers use these to run on different customer systems. So you want to know how reliable they are. So I consider the rank provided by Metasploit to be a high bar of reliability. If they got it up to great, which they consider like reliable against a single platform but not multiple, um, then I don't think that anybody in the malware industry would do any better. And if somebody in the malware industry did do better, JDuck would go find it and improve his own code. So that's a pretty good indicator for how reliable it is. And then finally, I'm also given um, uh, a URL to the original blog post that disclosed this vulnerability. So this was a zero-day disclosure that was put up on reverseCode.com <coughs> and uh, was, not, was not given to the vendor. Uh, that's the first place it was located. And then finally, I get a reference to OSVDB, which has uh, more information about this, about this vulnerability. Uh, OSVDB is the open source vulnerability database. So if you're purchasing stuff from Secunia or from iDefense or from iSight Partners, OSVDB basically has the same thing, but it's community developed. So to recap, because I know that was a lot, uh, I took exploit kits, I distilled them into the vulnerabilities they're exploiting, and then I searched for metadata about those vulnerabilities through a variety of means with Shodan. So now I have a mapping of exploit kits to the CVEs they exploit and metadata about those CVEs. So now, let me give you a preview of what the data shows. It's pretty simple, actually. This might be stuff that you've all heard of before. It's just gonna be wood. <laughs> um, first, if we analyze the data in this way, we can show that Java was very easily predictable as the next target as far back as 2008. Uh, we can show this in two different ways. We can show it based on trending data for exploit kit usage uh, and the research community interest in this, in this application, or we can do it via uh, basic adversarial analysis, a basic attack graph that shows the level of effort that people had to take to uh, install malware on your computer via this vector. The next thing that I'm going to show is that DEP is a significant obstacle for mass malware exploit writers. DEP is, a, is an exploit mitigation that adds obstacles to exploitation. So you have to spend more effort in order to make an exploit that bypasses DEP than if it weren't there. Uh, what I'll show is that from the data I collected, mass malware exploit writers are not able to bypass DEP to this day. The way that they bypass it is by stealing code from other public sources. Finally, the next thing that I'm going to show is that mass malware exploit writers greatly prefer custom code, or greatly prefer public code over custom development. They prefer not to develop their own exploits. So public exploit code is a very reliable indicator that they will then begin using the exploit for that vulnerability. 
and I can show you that there are different sources they prefer more than others. And the reasons why they prefer other sources are because of um, uh, the level of information detail that's provided with them. So things like targeted attack data, uh, exploits that were used in targeted attacks and then became public at some point in time because you know, a white hat researcher was analyzing them and wanted to share it with the world, uh, those get abused very quickly. However, um, uh, vulnerabilities that are announced in vendor advisories that have very limited detail, those do not get um, exploited in such wide numbers. Uh, okay. So, first case study, let's talk about Java. So, uh, Java started off in December 2008 when a single prominent researcher found the calendar deserialization bug. And it was relatively um, unknown for a long period of time until it was nominated for what's called a Pony Award, which is a, I don't know how to describe it. It's a, it's a award ceremony that people give to significant contributions in the area of exploitation techniques over the year. It's done at Black Hat, and it's, uh, it's pretty fun. But basically what this did is it ignited interest in this, in this particular target. People looked at it. They saw it was a big mountain that they could go mine. Um, so at the same time that it, that it uh, won a Pony Award, other security researchers noticed that this was a viable attack vector and began mining it for additional vulnerabilities and submitting them to a service called ZDI, the Zero Day Initiative. Uh, around the same time, a little bit after the conference, those, uh, those vulnerabilities began trickling out and they came with lots of, lots of information detail about um, what they were, what component they were in, um, how you would exploit them, things like that. That kind of information is very important to people like IDS vendors, to antivirus vendors, to network defenders that work at corporations, but it's also a good, uh, a good source of information for malware writers. Um, so finally, after all of this increased exposure, uh, in November 2009, one exploit kit integrated a Java exploit. Uh, they integrated the calendar deserialization bug that came out a year prior, and you can see it was this, this kit called the Just Exploited Kit. They only used three exploits, uh, or three groups of exploits. And as I said before, most kits include somewhere between five and 20. But this was hugely successful. You can see that Java was responsible for the largest number of exploit, uh, largest number of malware installations out of any other exploit they were using. So this was viewed as a successful startup in this little crimeware economy. And other people definitely followed suit, but they didn't do so very quickly. This industry moves quite slowly when you take a look at it in detail. So around the same time that Just Exploit It uh, published their kit that included the Java exploit, the second batch of ZDI disclosures came out. So you can see the research community is fairly far ahead of where the malware community was. Uh, they're already at their second round of, of vulnerabilities that are coming out, whereas the malware community is only at the first. Uh, so two months later, we get three more kits that integrate batches of vulnerabilities from the first and second ZDI disclosure. So now things are starting to really heat up. At this point, I would have called it, stuck a fork in it, and said, this is it. We're going to get hurt by this very soon. Uh, less than three months later, we had, again, the third round. Uh, of this back and forth that occurred with the research community when there were three zero-day disclosures that were dropped within a short period of, them, of, of each other, uh, in particular CVE 2010-0886, which was the Java Web Start vulnerability that was discovered by Tavis Mandy from Google. Uh, he dropped this with full exploit code onto full disclosure, and what do you know, there's high awareness between all the different kits that Java exploits are very successful, and a couple of kits that have experience in integrating them, and in the days after, a lot, a lot of kits started to integrate Java exploits, and ex exploitation targeting of this particular platform went through the roof. Uh, so you can see here in April 2010, um, the level of exploitation of Java jumped from about 60, 000, uh, 600,000 machines per quarter to over 6 million machines per quarter. Uh, and we definitely could have seen this trend coming um, much earlier than most people did. So, the takeaway now is where we're at now. Uh, out of the 15 kits that I analyzed, 11 of them include exploits for Java, seven of them include exploits for more than one vulnerability in Java. Uh, pretty significant targeting and it's not likely to go down. Um, some philosophical questions we can ask about this data are, who followed who? Was it the malware industry or the research community? Uh, from the data, it looks like the research community is actually well ahead of where the malware guys are coming, so it pays attention. It, it, uh, 
it pays to understand who the significant contributors are in that scene and to pay attention to them to see what's coming next. Uh, and then another sort of philosophical question, why can we even compare these two groups together? Are we helping by disclosing vulnerabilities, by airing out the sort of dirty laundry that all these different software vendors have, um, by holding them to task and making sure that they implement secure software? Um, it might not be the right way to do things, but maybe I'll talk about that in a different presentation. So after this slide, most people ask, all right, so you correctly identified Java as being, the as being a pain point uh, like a year or two before it actually was. What's the next pain point? And the pain point isn't so much a software product at this point. Uh, there's a different trend that's more significant. Um, like Java and Flash will continue to be the next pain point because it's the quickest path to install malware in, uh, through both IE and Firefox. You only need one of these exploits to gain malware installation privileges on a person's computer. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about why that is later. But the new trends, the new trend is uh, that most of these attacks, uh, that most of these massively exploited vulnerabilities are coming from targeted attacks. In 2010, there was a massive increase in the availability of both zero-day exploits uh, that were put out on the internet from, from White Hat security research uh, researchers and uh, a huge increase in availability of targeted attack code that was put out on the internet after those targeted attacks happened. Um, so, for instance, uh, while I was giving this presentation, there was an Adobe Flash zero day that came out on Monday, April 11th. Can't remember the CVE for it, but Adobe uh, rushed out to release a patch by Friday of that week, by April 15th. And this exploit code was proven successful. It successfully infected, uh, it successfully exploited and gained access to a number of different companies. And it fit into the, to the mode of operation that mass malware authors like to use. Um, they were able to implant it inside of a website that they uh, get access to through their mass SQL injections and other, other means that we went over before. Um, so it was rapidly abused by the following Monday, so three days later. Um, so that's the sort of thing that if you know how these guys are operating, then I can tell you that that exploit that was published on that Monday is going to be way more significant than any other vulnerability disclosure that occurs during that period. You need to have a specialized process to deal with that vulnerability much, much quicker than any other one that you've, uh, that you've looked at in that period. And the sad irony over here with the vendor advisories is that um, once you have a patch from the vendor, once the vendor has disclosed a vulnerability um, and they've announced it on their, on their advisory page, that uh, that vulnerability is no longer really an issue. It's not, it's not likely to be exploited if it was announced by the vendor. It was much more likely to be exploited if it's announced by a third party. So that was sort of a naive analysis of the data. Maybe we can do a little bit more of an interesting one. Uh, you know, by tracking targeting trends, we're just identifying future pain points, but maybe we can do better. Uh, maybe we can completely deny these kits the ability to operate. So let's do a little bit of a historical analysis. Uh, let's go back in time to January 1st, 2009 and ask ourselves, what can we put in place to mitigate all exploits that would have been experienced by your company for the following two years? And there's a restriction, and the restriction is you're not allowed to patch anything. Um, patching is basically a last line of defense, and I'm forcing you to acknowledge that in this scenario. So to recap, in 2009, uh, desktop computers had Internet Explorer 7, they had Firefox 3, Adobe Reader 9, a whole slew of different plugins, and we're running on Windows XP SP3. Vista was out at the time, but I doubt anybody used it. <laughs> uh, the data set for this period, over that two year period, was 27 exploits. That's from the beginning, that 13 and 14 exploits. So, first thing we're gonna do, let's partition the exploits based on our mitigation options. We can split them into two different categories of memory corruption and logic flaws and attack them independently. Out of the 19 memory corruption exploits, there were only five unique targets, which is kind of interesting, right? Out of all those 8,000 vulnerabilities every year, there are thousands of applications that are affected. But here I'm telling you, if you want to be pretty secure, you only really have to care about five targets. So that's unique and interesting by itself, but let's, let's sidestep that for a second. So the question we have to ask ourselves as a company is, do I have my sysadmins adhere to patch schedules, or do I have them test and enable DEP in four applications? What's the, what's the easiest to, uh, to do to defend myself? 
Uh, so if you're doing patch schedules, you'd have to patch IE monthly, you'd have to patch Flash Reader and Java quarterly, and you'd have to patch Firefox whenever the heck they feel like pushing out a patch, right? This can be a lot of work, and I'm certain that all of your assistant bins at your company are probably scream, or have been screaming at Adobe for all the different patches that come out all the time. They just want it to stop, right? So if we enable DEP in four applications, it mitigates 14 out of those 19 exploits. So our exposure has been greatly reduced, right? We're only left with about, where's that, five. Uh, so let's leave it at that for now. Let's continue on to the logic flaws and see what we can do about those. So with those, a similar story. We've got four unique targets. I crossed out Foxit because nobody really uses Foxit in a corporate environment. Uh, so the question we ask ourselves again here is do we have a business case to justify getting repeatedly compromised by mass malware? Because if we do, then we're not going to take any of, these, any of these actions. But if we don't, then uh, you really only have to do three things, and you limit your exposure from eight logic flaws to two. Um, and those three things are disallowing Java from running in the Internet zone. So when you go to a website and you load up a Java applet, uh, you're not allowed to do that anymore, right? Java in an enterprise environment is basically used, or most commonly used, for um, fat client applications, things like uh, IIS Site Protector, or um, I don't know if Application Security Inc. has uh, a big fat client that they want to be cross-platform in order to use their tool. Uh, but that's the most common reason to use Java, not to load up applets from NewYorkTimes.com. So we cross out that attack vector. The next thing we do is we configure Reader, Adobe Reader, to prompt on JavaScript execution. Most PDFs don't contain JavaScript. And if they do, all this does is it, prevent, it puts a little yellow bar at the top of Reader that says, do you actually want to run this JavaScript? Yes? OK, good. Um, what this does is if Reader is opened in a tiny little invisible iframe and it's trying to exploit one of these vulnerabilities through op automatically opening your plugin, you can't hit that accept button. So it no longer works. Uh, finally, what we can do is, or what we have to do, is we have to disallow embedded executables from running inside of PDFs. You can, you can shove an executable, a .exe, inside of a PDF that runs when you click a little uh, a box. And there were a couple of social engineering attacks, or rather um, flaws, or uh, social engineering attacks that utilized application flaws um, in order to get these executables to automatically run when you open Reader. So uh, as long as you uncheck that little box, now there's no more executables that you can store inside of Reader or inside of a PDF. So three things, right? Um, OK. So now what does that leave us with? These are the exploits that I consider the most severe from the two-year period based on our inability to mitigate them, right? Uh, we have a couple different applications. I crossed out QuickTime and Java because Java we mitigated by not allowing things from the Internet Zone. QuickTime, I'm just going to hope that your corporate desktop doesn't have it installed. Uh, the rest of these are, are pretty difficult to, um, to get around. So the next step, now we have to take a, a little bit more of a, of a sophisticated approach towards mitigating these. And if we're so far ahead um, by implementing DEP and we're not exposed to many of these vulnerabilities, we're just kind of coasting, uh, you might have noticed that something called the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit came out, or EMET. Uh, this is a Microsoft tool that adds additional obstacles to exploitation. Just like DEP makes it more difficult for somebody to write an exploit, uh, it includes multiple um, strategies to make it more difficult. So in this case, uh, you know, we can use it in a bunch of different ways. We can use it to harden legacy applications that may not be receiving patches. Uh, we can add temporary protections to applications that we know have zero-day vulnerabilities that are out in the wild, but we aren't able to patch yet. Or we could add permanent protections to highly targeted applications, like those four or five applications that just keep getting pounded by attackers. So in this case, we'll take them and we'll do those permanent protections. We'll only enable one thing, the EAT filter, so the rest of them aren't going to have an effect on your system that might be uh, negative. Now what are we left with? Two. These are the two logic flaws that are left, the only two exploits in that two-year period that you would have been affected by. And what do we know from all the exploit kits that we've collected? 
that the Firefox exploit is only included in one kit, and it's not very heavily used. So now we're down to one, right? And that's pretty good. From 27 to one without patching, I feel pretty safe. Uh, to review, here are the things that we did. Um, the easy mitigations got rid of 22 out of 27 exploits. We had DEP on three applications. We have no Java in the internet zone, and we disallowed embedded executables from running inside of PDFs. Uh, I left off there um, prompting on JavaScript. Good question. Yeah? You said no Java in the internet zone. You, you mean JavaScript or Java? Java. Java. Yes. Um, finally, for the, for the remaining five exploits, we had to take a little bit of a harder turn on these. Um, we applied emet to only two applications, IE and Reader, which happen to be the two most attacked applications. Uh, if you wanted to mitigate against that help center XSS, you didn't have a whole lot of options. That's also notable that um, the same guy that dropped that massively exploited Java exploit, uh, Java, yeah, actually dropped it as an exploit, um, was responsible for that one. That was Tavis or Mandy. Again, uh, thank you, Tavis. Um, <clears throat> so what that means is he's a person to pay attention to. When he says something severe, it's pretty bad. <laughs> so you might want to have a special process to be the, uh, you know, the, the Tavis flag in your vulnerability tracking system. Um, and then finally with Firefox, we at least understand what our real risk is, um, independent of the vulnerability. The vulnerability allows people to you know, gain access to your computer, but in this case now we know exactly who could gain access to your computer and how likely it is that they're going to gain access to your computer. And that may be easier for you to accept as a business or to argue that Firefox is not worth the risk of uh, installing on your corporate desktop. And then these, these um, mitigations uh, ensure that you have very limited susceptibility going forward based on um, other information that I've presented uh, and we'll talk about later. So, breath here. We can do better. <laughs> we can still do better. Um, what we did there is we looked at the exploits uh, very individually. We grouped them into those two different categories of memory corruption and logic flaws. But if we zoom out another level, what we see are that all of the exploits that are being used to target you are the result of two things. Uh, they're your users browsing to internet websites, and they always take the shortest path to install malware with a single exploit. So what do I mean by a single exploit? In this case, we start at malicious HTML, so somebody browses to the internet because they're not exploiting you through your internet applications. And uh, they're not going to go and target Google Chrome because Google Chrome, in order to get to the step where you would install malware, you'd need to bypass that sandbox. In IE8, um, you have a similar thing called protected mode, which Microsoft says isn't a security boundary, but it actually tends to, to become one when you're writing an exploit. Um, so what malware authors tend to use, the, the similarity, the commonality between all of the exploits that I studied are that they always take this bottom path. They always just jump from a weak, um, from IE7 that doesn't have protected mode or IE8 that doesn't have protected mode in certain circumstances uh, or Java or Flash and they jump from that node directly to installing malware. Um, so maybe, maybe there's a way that we can force them to take the top path. If we can cut out the availability of this bottom path, then they won't be able to do anything. So one way of doing that, one way that I came up with for doing this, oh, and you can read more about attack graphs um, and this sort of adversarial analysis in presentations by Dino Dizovi or DDZ uh, in a presentation he titled Memory Corruption Exploitation in You and an upcoming presentation that he has scheduled to be published in like a week or two. Um, one, one solution that I came up with is something called Google Chrome Frame. Uh, most of you may not have heard of this. If you notice here, I have a Chrome logo inside of an Internet Explorer 7 about page. What this does is it embeds the Google Chrome uh, renderer inside of an Internet Explorer process. And you can control it with an HTML header, with an HTTP header. Uh, so, for instance, if I have Chrome Frame installed and I browse to Gmail with, with it installed, uh, Google will send down this extra header and now my Gmail will be rendered as Chrome would render it instead of how IE would render it. And this gets around things like lack of HTML5 support, this sort of thing. But the other thing that it does is it puts a sandbox inside of Internet Explorer. So if we're a little bit creative about this, and if you have a web proxy like a blue coat, for every single internet site you go to, you could have blue coat mangle the HTTP headers that come back and add that extra header. So now every time I browse the web, 
it's always through the Chrome renderer. It's not through IE anymore. But every time I browse the internet, it's through regular Internet Explorer. And this works for most companies because the reason why you can't patch IE is because it breaks compatibility with things that you bought from vendors. Internet websites are standard around HTML and JavaScript. This is why you can use Chrome when you go home, or you can use Firefox when you go home, or Internet Explorer 9. But internally, it's a different story. So we can actually manipulate that uh, via your web proxy and ensure that every time you browse the web, it's through a sandboxed uh, web browser, which as we um, identify the attack graph, uh, is um, attackers, mass malware exploit writers, have demonstrated no capability to bypass. Uh, for certain websites that do break with this, you can just maintain a, web, uh, a whitelist in your proxy of sites that need you to not add that flag which is probably going to be simpler than responding to thousands of malware incidents every year. Uh, and then the great thing about this is that it's completely seamless to your users. They don't have to click a different icon on their desktop. They won't see anything different when they browse the web. As long as they go through your proxy, when they browse the web, it'll be in Chrome. And when they browse the internet, it'll be in Internet Explorer. And they won't have malware on their machine because uh, malware writers can't exploit, um, can't use multiple exploits to break out of sandboxes. Okay, <laughs> so to, to sum up, that's how I would attack mass malware. That's how I would cut off their capability to function um, in an effective manner. And now, finally, after we've tackled this threat of mass malware, now we can start to think about what we would do against targeted attackers. Now we can think about what we would do against APT. And we would follow the same process where we analyze the capabilities, the methods, the, the motives of those two attack groups through a kill chain model, through an adversarial attack graph model to find the defenses that work best. So to sum up, uh, my immediate recommendations are don't wait to act on Flash and Java. They're still the quickest way to install malware on all computers. Um, pay attention to targeted attack disclosures in 2011. They're only gaining steam in terms of their um, the, uh, the, the quickness in which they are abused in massive attacks. Um, if you're a vendor or if you're a, if you're a corporate defender, um, you, in order to gain the most uh, benefit out of your defenses, you want to force malware authors to use multiple exploits to compromise your environment. So seriously consider things like Google Chrome Frame or other sandboxes like Sandboxy or uh, vendor products that may claim to do the same thing, but watch out for those, test those first, because a lot of them don't actually do what they say. Um, if you're, a, if you're a consultant or a managed service provider or a scanner vendor, if you're Application Security Inc., if you're Rapid7, um, does your scanner evaluate vulnerabilities the same way that an attacker does? Because if it doesn't, then it may be misguiding you into patching vulnerabilities that I, as an attacker, don't really care about. Um, and then finally, uh, hopefully through this whole, this whole process of using mass malware as a case study, I've showed you that intelligence-driven response can be practical uh, and more effective and less costly than compliance-based security, and that uh, attack data is the most important piece of data that you can have access to in order to determine your actual risk. Uh, a couple of people that helped me out. Um, these are guys involved in the malware, uh, malware scene, uh, RC Coder, Mila, Frank, Francois, and uh, Adam Myers for giving me a lot of the exploit kit data that I had. Uh, Mike Kloppert and Dino Dizovi for a lot of the process and ideas and encouragement. Uh, Chris Clark, who was my boss at ISEC when I was working on this, he has since left, but he got me started and get, got me support inside of ISEC to do this. Uh, John Matherly runs the Shodan project and he fixed all my bugs that I found while I was uh, using his API. And Dean DeBeer for creating such an awesome product like ThreatGrid that uh, gave me access to a lot of the exploitation data and um, attack data that I needed to complete this project. Um, so uh, if you're looking for related presentations, I would suggest you take out those three, uh, take a look at those three, and I'll be giving this again with updated information next month at a conference called SummerCon. <sighs> so any, that's, that's all I got. I'm done now. Uh, are there any questions? It's uh, uh, malware that's uh, been installed over in Iran, Sussnet. Stuxnet? Stuxnet. Stuxnet, yes. <clears throat> what keeps that from coming over here? Uh, it is over here. Is it, it is over here. here. Yeah, it is over here. Okay. Um, Stuxnet is sort of an anomaly. Uh, it's an untargeted attack uh, that was used to accomplish a very targeted means, or uh, targeted effect. 
Um, but uh, if you wanted to defend yourself against things like Stuxnet, uh, they do not fit into this model of, of mass malware. They're, they're not coming from a mass malware adversary. So you would have to perform this analysis against a different attack group in order to figure out means to protect yourself against that. Um, but in actuality, a lot of the defenses that I came up with are applicable to both. So uh, you'll be much better off if you take a look at the, the more simplistic adversaries like mass malware first and work your way up the stack. Um, does that answer your question? Okay, so it, it's all over the place over here then, as yep. far as how come it, we don't hear more about it? I mean, I don't. Very few I people run Iranian uh, <coughs> PLCs. nuclear process. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> in other words, it's written in their language or something? Or? Uh, it's well, it's a limited it's, attack to, to Siemens PLC controllers. So unless you're running a SCADA network in a manufacturing or other type environment, you're not going to be vulnerable to it. It is specifically targeted at manufacturing type networks. And specifically right. targeted towards those specific controllers. Yeah. So not every SCADA type controller, but those that control the centrifuges. I guess the thing to remember here is that Stuxnet is a very limited threat. Like we're saying that yes, it's all over here, but Stuxnet compared with mass malware like Zeus and SpyEye and Gozi and Clampy and the rest of those that I could rattle off on for, for hours, uh, there are significantly more of those that are going to affect your network than there are of Stuxnet. And um, Stuxnet is fairly targeted. It's, I mean, yes, it's, it's like an opportunistic approach to getting access to those react, uh, centrifuges and things, right. but um, it's still not as widely exposed as mass malware is. Mass malware is the most widely exposed adversary out there. You will encounter it in your daily life thousands of times more frequently than you will Stuxnet. So I'm trying to get the biggest bang for my buck with this presentation. No, I just understand that, but yeah. Ben, the other piece here was that uh, I think in the utility sector sure. or in the energy sector, you'll probably see a lot more conversation on Stuxnet than you would in a general, in a general setting. Or those things target specifically the SCADA systems. So the SCADA systems. Well, I actually have some frequently asked questions. Or, well, this one doesn't make sense. Uh, okay, so one of the things that I'm really concerned about is that nobody's performed this kind of analysis in the information security industry before. Um, people tend to be myopically focused on vulnerabilities and malware, but they don't tend to consider exploits of the full chain of events that goes on in terms of defense. Uh, so I'm actually pitching this to different like antivirus firms or threat intelligence firms, like iDefense, iSight, to keep up with. Um, because I did this as a point in time analysis, but going forward, there really ought to be a product base around this, and there isn't, and that's like a, it's a tragedy. Um, because it's obviously, from the case studies that I've presented, a very effective way at going about defense, but it requires specialized attention that may, uh, many like corporate defenders um, may not have access to. Uh, it takes you know a, a person like me to sit down and do all this stuff to have research time um, that I uh, I might not be able to accomplish if I were working for uh, you know Citibank or whatever. So that's one thing. Can I ask you how long did the whole project or analysis take? Um, two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, basically, I, that's uh, sort of a mis misnomer a little bit because. I built up the contacts, all the different people that gave me access to the kits, all the different people that helped me bounce ideas off them over a very long period of time, and I had this in my head for quite a while before I got around to actually coming up with a way to put it all together. So if you stretch it out to like from idea inception to implementation, it's probably like a year. I was thinking about this in like early 2010, late 2009. Um, let's see. Sometimes people ask me, what are my thoughts about software diversity? Uh, like, obviously, um, if you're running Macs or if you're running different browsers, then this might be a good defense against somebody that are, always targets the bottom line. Uh, in actuality, you'd have to go pretty diverse if you wanted to, to get outside of the capabilities of different mass malware attackers. Um, you, you wouldn't be able to run things like Opera. You wouldn't be able to run things like Firefox. Uh, you're still a target even with those third-party applications. And those introduce additional problems in your infrastructure. Uh, for other threats, for targeted attackers, for APT, it becomes substantially more difficult to detect and respond to those incidents if you run a heterogeneous environment. Uh, the more homo uh, homogeneous your environment is, um, the easier it is to pick out those needles and to find things that don't belong. So in, uh, in other presentations that I have about infective, uh, <laughs> infective, effective intrusion detection, I recommend against this strategy. 
Any other questions? Okay. Um, if you guys want to contact me, my email address is dguido at Isaac Partners, and I'm also on Twitter at dguido. Okay? Excellent. Excellent.